In this video, we're going to look at nuclear power and what it is, as well as the processes of fission and fusion, and how the physics behind them gives us the energy that we can utilize for nuclear power to create electricity. To start us off, let's remind ourselves about this idea of binding energy per nucleon. Basically, this was the idea of when a nucleus forms, the mass of the protons and neutrons individually is larger than the mass of the nucleus as a whole. Well, that mass didn't just disappear, it was converted into energy. We call this the binding energy. It's the energy stored inside that nucleus. It's released when the nucleus is formed. Well, if we were to find the binding energy per nucleon, that's taking that binding energy and dividing it by the number of protons and neutrons total, essentially the mass number, uh, for every single element there is, we get a graph that looks something like this. Uh, this graph is representing the mass number here on the x-axis and the binding energy per nucleon on the y-axis. And you'll see a distinct shape showing up here. Um, there are a couple areas here that make these little peaks, like there's a peak at helium-4, there's a peak at carbon-12, there's a peak at oxygen-16, and then overall, there's a peak here at iron-56. Now, the, at these peaks, these are stable, the most stable configurations of these atoms. Um, the most stable of all of them is iron 56. This is going to be really important in our understanding of fission and fusion. And this stability here is basically looking at the energy that's released. This is the most energetically stable element that there is. These other ones like helium and oxygen and carbon are locally stable, which means in our universe, we actually find higher percentages of these elements than we do about the elements around them. It's, it's higher than statistics would say, just on average, different things would be found because they're more energetically stable. Now, the reason we care about this is because where these elements lie in relation to iron 56 dictates whether or not it is more energetically stable for them to undergo the process of fission or the process of fusion. So we're going to start out by looking at the process of fission. Fission is where you have something that's pretty large already. So something like uranium-235. And uranium-235 by itself is actually fairly stable. It will undergo alpha decay, but that happens over half-lives of billions of years. If you add a neutron to uranium-235, it absorbs that and becomes uranium-236. Uranium-236 is not stable. That's too large of a nucleus for it to be able to handle everything that's going on. So uranium-236 actually can't handle it, and it splits off into two not equal but smaller parts. Uh, here in this example is barium-144 and krypton-89. Um, now, the proton number here, 56 plus 36, adds up to 92, but the total mass number doesn't add up to that 236. This total mass number actually adds up to 233, which means that in the process, we created some neutrons as well. Um, these are, We know they're neutrons because it doesn't involve that proton number. Here, I need three more neutrons to make the math work. So these three neutrons are produced when this splits off. They fly off uh, to then go on and create fission elsewhere. So uranium-235 turns into uranium-236, turns into... Krypton and barium, uh, and then these other three neutrons in the process. Those three neutrons will become really important to us. All right, we are going to do some calculations. To do these calculations, we're going to need to remember some of the things that are in this data booklet, namely the masses of these electrons, protons, and neutrons, and some conversions that we can use for the unified atomic mass. This U value, again, in kilograms, can be found, or in this MEVC to the minus 2, we can use that as well, especially when we're talking about mass defect and the energy associated. So let's look at another example of the fission reaction here. Um, we again are starting with a neutron and uranium-235. Uh, we know the mass of a neutron. We can find that on our table. We also uh, can be given the, the mass of uranium. These are all in kilograms here. The mass of rubidium, the mass of cesium, and then two neutrons, so I'll just multiply that by two. It's going to produce some energy as well that will have no mass. What we care about is we're going to compare the mass before 
to the mass after. The mass before is 391.848 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. The mass after is 391.525 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. You'll notice here that the mass before is slightly larger than the mass after. We saw this before. We saw the same idea in binding energy that one plus one is greater than two. The mass of the parts is larger than the mass of the whole, which means that some of that mass was converted into energy. Um, this gamma here is the key. That gamma is the energy that was produced. Well, we can figure out how much energy that is by first taking the difference of these mass. Um, so we can find that the, the mass defect here, the difference is 0.323 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Converting that into atomic mass units, into this U, we'll just have to use that conversion found in the data booklet that says that one U, one atomic mass unit, is 1.661 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. That gives us our mass defect, 0 0.19446 atomic mass units. Well, that is an energy, that is mass. So to convert that into energy, uh, the easiest way into mega electron volts is to just multiply it by 931 and a half. Um, that is the mass of atomic mass units in this MeV C to the minus two. If I take that and put it into equals MC squared, the C's cancel, and I'm left with this as my energy. This isn't actually technically binding energy. This is just the energy that is released. Um, and every single time that this happens, a little bit of energy is released because the mass isn't the same before and after. That is going to be the key to nuclear power. We can also produce energy in another way. We can produce energy through the process of fusion, where fission was like a fissure, where you're splitting an atom into two parts. Fusion is adding them together, fusing these atoms into one larger thing. Um, a biggest example that we'll see is in the sun, uh, two atoms of hydrogen can merge into an atom of helium. Now we can see this displayed in a nuclear reaction, nuclear equation here. I've got two atoms of hydrogen two. Uh, we can see that the mass of each of those is given. Uh, produce an atom of helium and a neutron. Now we can look at the mass defect, find the difference between the mass before and the mass after. Just add up the hydrogens and then subtract out the helium and neutron. Neutron, um, you'll see that the helium and neutron together are just a little bit smaller than the hydrogens were. Well, that mass didn't disappear. It was produced as energy. So we can find this mass defect as 0 0.0034. Multiply that by this 931.5, and we'll end up getting the energy in mega electron volts um, shown here, 3.1671. Again, that isn't really the binding energy. That's just the energy being released. So in this graph, this graph is important that if we are below iron, 56, if it's smaller than that, it is going to release energy if atoms merge together. So merging those atoms together in fusion will release energy. If you are larger than iron, 56, like uranium, 235 certainly is, um, splitting that up will release energy. If you kept going, um, so for example, if you're fusing things together, it is not energetically um, advantageous for those atoms to merge any further beyond iron 56. We see this happening in stars. Even the largest stars cannot create anything larger than iron 56. That's where the process of fusion stops and the star eventually dies. Same thing with fission, that a fission will never uh, happen for anything smaller than iron 56 because you actually need extra energy to do that. It doesn't release energy in the process. So this release of energy is where we get the energy from these uh, uranium atoms. Well, energy density is something that we talked about before. Uranium has a huge amount of energy density. Uh, in the process here, we can actually produce a ton of energy by harvesting that little bit of energy that happens every time fission uh, under, undergoes. So let's talk about the process of this nuclear power. We start with uranium. This is a picture of uranium ore. It just looks like a rock. It fluoresces a little bit under UV light. You'll see like little streaks of green fluorescing in that rock. Now, primarily uranium is found in the Earth's crust in two primary isotopes, uranium-238 
and uranium-235. 238 is by far the most abundant. So over 99% of the natural uranium is 238. Um, turns out that this uranium-235, as we saw in the example, that is the uranium that can undergo fission, which means that that is the uranium we need for nuclear power. Um, we'll talk more about why we or how we get more of that later on. You'll see that the uranium in the U.S. comes from a variety of different places. The U.S. doesn't have a whole lot of uranium. Um, most of our uranium comes from uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Uzbekistan, or Canada, or Australia. So elsewhere is where we're getting our uranium for our nuclear power from. Now, this uranium ore is not a very concentrated form of uranium. Uh, you, If you were transporting that, you'd end up transporting mostly the mass of the rock. So instead, it is milled down into a powder and merged with oxygen to create what's known as yellow cake uranium. It's not as delicious as it sounds. This powder here is a lot easier to transport, um, but it's still in the same uh, percent abundances that it was before. So it's primarily U-238 still. What we need to do next is to enrich that uranium. The enrichment isn't the process of turning it into yellow cake. It is making more of the uranium by percentage 235 than it was before. There are two main ways that we can enrich and get a higher concentration of 235 than natural uranium. One way is something called gaseous diffusion. Basically, you pressurize um, this steam uh, mixed with uranium and have this membrane here. Um, the membrane will more likely let the 235 pass through because it's slightly smaller than 238. So that 235 will pass through uh, at a higher rate than the 238 does. And in the process, on the other side of that barrier, you get some enriched steam. So that steam will have a higher concentration of 235 than it did before. So we're weeding out some of the 238s they're not making through that process. Another way is using something called a, a centrifuge. A centrifuge is something that spins up really, really fast. You may have seen something like this in medical examples. We use a centrifuge to, to separate blood um, quite a bit into component parts. Well, this centrifuge um, spins up very, very fast, much faster than a medical centrifuge does. And in the process, the heavier uranium-238 kind of settle out on the outsides, whereas the U-235, which is lighter, kind of stays closer towards the center. If uh, a sample of that uranium then is extracted from the center, it is enriched. It has a higher percentage of 235. Now, if you do this process over and over and over and over again, you can end up enriching that uranium to be a higher and higher percentage of the 235. Remember, as uranium ore, it starts at about 0.2 or 0.72%. Um, so under 1% of that uranium is the fissionable uranium-235. After it undergoes this, uh, these steps of centrifuge or gaseous diffusion to enrich it, you can get it up to fuel-grade uranium. That's sitting at around 3.5% or 4% uranium-235. That will become very important in a minute. Um, I want to point out here, though, that fuel-grade uranium is very different than the uranium that's used in like, a nuclear weapon. To become weapons-grade uranium, you would need it to be over 90% uranium-235. So I think it's useful to get a visual of what this looks like. So if I had a sample of uranium, um, and it was uranium ore, only two, or less than 1%, so 0.72% of that is U-235, and the rest is 238. 235 here is represented by the little green squares here. It is a very, very low percentage overall. The way that we enrich it isn't by adding extra U-235. Like, they already exist, and we can't get more of them. So the only way to make the percentage higher is by eliminating some of the 238, which means that our sample gets smaller. So from uranium ore to fuel-grade uranium, you can see just how much less uranium we have. This is how much we would need to refine that to enrich it to get it down to 4%. Um, if I wanted to go even further to get to weapons grade 90%, you see you have very, very little uranium left. So that process is significant. Um, and it's one of the reasons that not every uh, country has access to nuclear weapons. It's because it's hard to get there. Um, that 
the the technology required to refine uranium not only for nuclear power but even further uh, is not something that that is common uh, and found everywhere so once we have enriched that uranium to fuel grade around four three and a half or four percent it is uh, repackaged into fuel rods each fuel rod has these little nuggets of of that uranium here kind of set up in this rod and then that rod is set into an array of hundreds of fuel rods and they are kind of connected together like this that is the the nuclear array the array of uranium that is used inside the nuclear reactor all right so as we saw every time a uranium undergoes fission it splits apart but also releases a little bit of energy that energy heats up um, so the more energy that's created the hotter and hotter this reactor becomes and just like we see with pretty much any power plant the process of creating electricity in a nuclear power plant is just heating up water and turning it into steam so here we have a nuclear reactor um, that heats up water turns it into steam runs it through a turbine and then it comes back down and condenses and cools uh, you may be familiar with that cooling tower that look that is the classic nuclear power plant well most people don't realize that inside that cooling tower there is nothing radioactive all of that is is just a way of cooling down the steam and anything that you see coming out of that is just water vapor so the nuclear process isn't happening in there that's just water that's just steam the nuclear reactor is actually in the enclosed part of that nuclear power plant all right so the secret sauce here is that you need a lot of these fission reactions to create that amount of energy and the way that we do that is something called a chain reaction here is an example of a chain reaction uh, represented by mouse traps so here you see one mouse trap can trig be triggered by a ping pong ball well, if they are all set up with a ping pong ball and you send a ping pong ball in, nice. that ping pong ball releases another, which releases another and hits another and hits another, and eventually creates this chain reaction where each one causes another reaction, which causes another, and then it keeps going. In this case, it kind of goes out of control. It happens really, really fast. But this process, um, can be controlled and we'll talk about the ways that it's controlled and continue itself and each one creates a little bit of energy and overall can sustain itself so remember that only four percent of the fuel in a nuclear reactor is 235 atoms those are the ones that can undergo this fission reaction and um neutrons how this all starts need to be traveling relatively slowly to be captured by a u-235 so let's see what this looks like. There are ways that we can control how fast the neutrons are going. One way that we can control them is using a moderator. A moderator is typically water or graphite. And the goal here is that it slows down neutrons. So it makes it so that the neutrons aren't traveling quite as fast. And if they aren't traveling as fast, they are more likely to be absorbed by a U-235 atom to undergo fission, to create 236 and split apart. Now if the reaction is going too fast if it was like that mouse trap uh you need control rods to absorb extra neutrons um the more neutrons you absorb the slower the reaction goes because there aren't as many neutrons to create another reaction so these control rods can be inserted or removed to give some layer of control on how much you are moderating or uh damping down those chain reactions so here is a picture, a diagram of what this might look like. U-235 splits up into two atoms and produces three neutrons. Well, there are a couple different fates that those neutrons can take on. One is that neutron could be going too fast. It doesn't go through a moderator and it goes too fast, goes right through the U-235. It can't be absorbed. It doesn't produce another reaction. Another possibility is it hits a control rod. If it does, that is being absorbed and it doesn't make it to another 235 and it doesn't produce anything else now the third option is you have this moderator and the neutron goes through the moderator slows down and doesn't actually 
um, hit a control rod. So if that's the case, it will be absorbed by the U-235, which then splits and produces three more neutrons. Um, this process continues. Uh, it can either go too fast, hit a control rod, or perfect to trigger another reaction. The goal here for a perfectly sustaining nuclear chain reaction is that each one produces one more. If it produces multiple, it's going to grow exponentially. If it doesn't produce any, it's going to die down. So you need that chain reaction to continue but not get out of control. There are nuclear power plants all over the country. Um, most of these are fairly old. So nuclear power plants are retired after 60 years. And you can see kind of the retiring date of these nuclear reactors coming up into the future. So um, we haven't built any new ones for a while. Um, and this creates about 20% of the electricity in the US. And it's been that way for the last couple decades. Um, we will see a situation here coming up in the next couple decades that we will need to make a decision on whether or not we build new nuclear reactors, um, repurpose the ones that already exist with new technology, or let them retire and move on to other sources of energy. Here are a couple power plants in Minnesota. Um, the Monticello nuclear power plant and the Prairie Island nuclear power plant. You'll notice that both of these are next to bodies of water. Um, that water is used for the cooling aspect of these nuclear power plants so they don't melt down and they can stay a, a stable temperature. You'll notice that neither of these have that classic nuclear power plant look with that cooling tower. So it's possible you've driven past one and didn't even know that it was a nuclear power plant. All right, now the hottest topic about nuclear power is the idea of nuclear waste. Now, nuclear power doesn't produce CO2. Uh, and that's one of the big reasons to move toward nuclear power is because it doesn't contribute to climate change or global warming. But it isn't without its faults. Um, when this nuclear reaction happens, each part of that split uranium-235 is also radioactive um, and has a certain half-life. You'll see that some of these parts have half-lives that are pretty small, uh, relatively small, in the span of dozens of years. Well, some of them have half-lives of millions of years, which means you can't just necessarily wait it out. You can't wait until this spent waste is no longer radioactive. And the uranium is only used for a certain amount of time. At a certain point, there isn't enough uranium-235 to be able to maintain that nuclear reaction and keep it going at a stable rate. So these spent fuel rods need to be decommissioned, basically. When they are no longer in the reactor, there's a certain life cycle that they go through. The first stop is they go into the bottom of one of these spent nuclear reactor pools. These are on site at the, the nuclear power plant. And basically, it's just a giant pool of water that these spent fuel arrays are submerged to the very bottom. Water is actually a really good insulator of radioactivity, so the radi radiation doesn't make it through that water. So the water serves to, to block any extra radiation that still exists, but also to cool these down because they were very hot and they need time, um, and water is a good coolant to help them cool down. Um, but they can't stay there forever. There are a bunch of reasons why that is not a good permanent solution. So after they are cooled down and they've had a chance for at least that um, highly radioactive short half-life uh, materials to decay, they are sent to a dry cask um, storage that is outside, but still on the facility. So this is basically like a giant concrete silo. Um, and it's not very tall or very large, but it is very thick, very many layers thick, um, that this spent fuel is basically encased. And that's where it lives. And right now, the nuclear power plants around the world basically have this. It's kind of like a little landfill, nuclear landfill, right outside the facility. This doesn't seem like a great long-term solution. So we are still searching for a better long-term. Uh, one possibility, oh, before I get to that, uh, one of my favorite comics, XKCD, uh, has a, a book called What If? And in that, Renamon Road talks about what would happen if you swam in one of these spent fuel pools? Um, it's a great read. I highly encourage you to check it out. Well, uh, talking about long-term solutions, some countries 
have talked about finding a disposal zone, a space to, to send all of this, and basically bury it down really deep into the earth. Um, and in the U.S., this zone, this area was designated as Yucca Mountain. Um, this is in a site in Nevada. And for a long time, this was the solution. This was the idea. And most of it is built. Uh, that There are these tunnel structure down below Yucca Mountain. Um, and many millions of dollars have gone into the construction of this facility. Well, um, it has been paused indefinitely. It is not being used and has no plans on being used in the future at this point. Uh, for a couple of reasons, it was found that there is some geological activity in that area, and that's not great if that's the space that you are storing all of your spent nuclear fuel. Um, but also, more importantly, states didn't want this nuclear fuel to be driven on the interstates through them, and Nevada wasn't too keen on having all of the nuclear radiation um, from the spent fuel from the entire country. So uh, Yucca Mountain died uh, in legislation and is no longer being pursued, which means we don't have a long-term solution. There are some countries that are building their own um, version of Yucca Mountain um, that isn't quite done yet, but has plans to be done. But right now we're still looking for final solutions, which means like, what other options are there? Well, for many reasons, uh, different things have been proposed. Things like burying it in the ocean or sending it to the bottom of the sea or drilling it into ice sheets or deep well injections. And there's some examples uh, being investigated in a variety of different ways. Uh, for a lot of reasons, sending them up into space isn't a great idea because rockets, as reliable as they have become lately, aren't perfect. And a rocket built with, filled with radioactive material, um, if it were to explode in the atmosphere, that would not be great uh, for humanity. So it's just too high risk. And right now, it's a much lower risk to keep this fuel um, on the ground at these facilities. Finally, um, the most exciting part, uh, looking ahead of the, uh, the future, is fusion. The possibility of fusion to be used. Because all nuclear power plants right now use fission. Fission, you start with uranium, which is pretty radioactive. And then you end with a bunch of other radioactive isotopes that stay radioactive and you have to get rid of it somehow. Well, fusion also produces energy, just like we saw in that fusion reaction earlier. There's this defect that gets converted into energy later on. Uh, each one adds up over many millions of reactions to produce a lot of energy. Well, fusion could be theoretically used as a power source in the future. The great part about fusion is helium is the product that you have two hydrogens emerges into a helium, neither of which are very dangerous. We have lots of hydrogen, plenty of hydrogen, um, and helium isn't radioactive. So your byproduct is something uh, that we don't have to worry about in the same way that we did before. It also, per mass, produces far more electricity than even nuclear power with fission does. Now, there are some issues that make this hard. Um, fusion is what's happening in the sun. And the reason that the sun can do it is that it is very, very hot. And so much gravity creates a high amount of pressure that keeps these atoms close to each other so that they have the ability to fuse together. But in order for them to fuse, they have to be moving very fast and they have to be close enough together that they actually collide. So to create it here on Earth, you have to create an ability to have a very, very high pressure but also a very, very high temperature. So building the container to contain this is really challenging. And the equipment required to keep the pressure and keep things contained uh, is pretty hard uh, to, to take on as well. There's been a lot of research in this area. And so far, fission has been produced, but, or sorry, fusion has been produced. But the problem is it has not created enough energy to cancel out the energy required to create the fusion in the first place. So it is not producing more energy that it takes, but the future looks bright. Um, so far, some of the studies have suggested that this might be possible, and there are facilities being built right now to test this out in a more large scale. Um, and scientists are optimistic that this, this could be a possibility in our future. It's not going to solve climate change in the near term, but if this is possible in the future, it's essentially free energy 
all the energy that we could possibly need could be produced in this way with very few side effects um, and issues that we have to deal with. So keep an eye out for fusion. Right now, it is not a possibility. From this video, you should be comfortable talking about fission and fusion, which elements would produce what, and how to calculate the energy produced in each of these reactions. You should also be able to describe the process of uranium going from uranium ore to ultimately the energy produced in a nuclear power plant.